All right, so now let's talk about humidity and uh, vapor pressure. So what is humidity? All right, so think about this. So let's say we take two different places. One is like a desert, a dry. The, another one, um, maybe one of those um, eastern or southern states, uh, like Florida, for example. So one of the things we have, if you live in a desert, then when you sweat, because it's so dry, the sweat evaporates very quickly and you then don't feel the hot as much. If you live somewhere like Florida, then what you have here is that there's humid humidity over there, it's a humid place. So when you sweat, it doesn't evaporate as quickly. So it stays with you and you feel it or it feels like it's hotter than it sort of like hotter than it is. And sometimes you might even see that some of the weather reports say that, you know, it's uh, 95, but it feels like 100. Why? Because of the humidity. Okay, so now one of the things we're gonna see here is that generally when your sweat evaporates, it's actually a cooling process. Your body cools down when that happens. So that's kind of like an example of humidity. So humidity has something to do with the amount of water vapor that is in the air, okay? If there's a lot of water vapor in the air, it is hard for sweat to evaporate from you. And if the air is dry, uh, where there's not much water, uh, then it is easy for sweat to evaporate from you. And then you basically cool down. So again, you can think of like, let's say this cooling, right, is our evaporation, right, is a, is a cooling process. Okay, now let's talk about then in terms of how we can understand this whole uh, humidity uh, process. So we're gonna start with a container like this. So let's say we have a container with water. Okay, now in this container right now, we have, um, let's say it's evacuated, you know, a container. That means we have water and, and vacuum. So that means this whole region here is vacuum. There's nothing there. Okay, now, at this point, what we have here is we have just water molecules. Okay, so let's call this, you know, uh, let's, let's call this state A. Okay, so this is state A where you have uh, just water molecules and nothing else. At this point, what we can, we can say here is that in this region, right? You know, so like, let's say there are no other molecules. So basically at this point, it doesn't contain any water vapor. So at some point, at later time, then some of the water molecules, remember we talked about, right? So there are molecules that are moving faster than the average, that are moving, some of them moving slower than the average. So those ones that are closer to the surface and moving faster than the average can actually escape and evaporate. That means eventually what we will have here is we will have some of the molecules here in that region, okay? Then what they, what happens is that when those molecules basically evaporate in this region, then they create what we call a partial pressure. Okay, so the partial pressure, let's call this PP, like P, partial pressure, right? So this was for the case A, right? Basically, or state A, it was zero. That's because basically, for state A, remember, right? We didn't have anything. There were no, you know, let's say uh, vapor molecules, right? No, no, no molecules over there. So the partial pressure was equal to zero. As those molecules start evaporating, then you can, you can say, right? So now we have some, you know, molecules like this. Let's call this state B. So this is gonna be B when you have now some molecules. So things like this. So right now this is B with some molecules. Okay, so when, when you have then this water molecules already evaporating, that means you have sort of like, let's say this from liquid to gas, right, transition. So some of the molecules going from liquid to gas. Okay, so eventually what you have here is you have more and more, you know, um, water molecules going from liquid to gas. But it all, it, it, it's, it's never just, you know, one-way highway, so like, let's say one-way road. 
some of the you know those molecules right those, those gas molecules can actually come back to become a liquid so you can also have a liquid to a gas sorry gas to a liquid so you can also have gas to a liquid going in opposite direction okay so that means what we have here this is then uh, basically evaporation so this is this process known as evaporation and what, when, what you have here is that the inverse process, right, from gas to liquid is known as a condensation, right? So that's a basically a condensation. Okay. So you have condensation going from gas to liquid and evaporation. And in a way, you can say that um, state A is when you have no, let's say, evaporation. So at that instant, right, there's, there are no molecules there. Uh, let's say uh, in, there was vacuum, right, in air, and all of them was, were liquid. And now what you have here is now you have evaporation, and at the same time, there's a little bit of condensation. So that means what you can say here is this, that for, for B, for example, so let's say this was A, right? So for A, one thing we can say that uh, uh, partial pressure was equals to zero. Okay, Par partial pressure is how much pressure those molecules that have evaporated, right? Uh, they're now basically in their gas form um, exert in the container. And obviously if there were no gas molecules, that means the partial pressure was zero. But now pressure, uh, partial pressure basically no longer zero and it increases, okay, it increases. And one thing we can say is that now we have the, let this R less, let's, let's this represent the rate at which the, you know, those, liquid molecules are evaporating. So rate of evaporation is greater than rate of condensation. Okay. That means we can say that the, the rate of evaporation greater than rate, rate of com, uh, condensation. Okay. And um, what we can have here is this process, right? That's gonna just continue. Okay, it's gonna continue. Now there's another thing that we have, uh, which is, um, it's called the, the vapor pressure, okay? So now what is then the vapor pressure? So you can think of like, let's say the vapor pressure is different from the partial pre pressure. So let me put here, right? This is partial pressure, which was equals to zero for this, for the state A. Um, is different that partial pre pressure basically represents the pressure at that instant of time at that specific temperature, depending on how many molecules you have. Since we didn't have any gas molecules, partial pressure was zero. But then there's also a vapor pressure. So vapor pressure So let's call it VP. So this is amount of you know the the, the gas molecules, right? There's water molecules in the air that you know, you can always have at the given temperature because this is gonna be a very specifically, you know, temperature dependent. That means at certain temperature, you can have, let's say this amount of, you know, a maximum amount of, uh, let's say uh, water molecules and vapor pressure presents the pressure of that maximum amount of molecules that you can have. So for example, vapor pressure at, um, let's say, you know, you're gonna see, right? Let's say that 30 degrees Celsius is you know it's going to be given in the table, so that's going to be um, thirty-one point. Uh, sorry, the vapor pressure is going to be four point twenty-four times ten to the three Pascal, for example. So that's going to be vapor pressure. Okay, so we can you know um, we can technically get those values in terms of um, Pascal and also Tor. So let's say it's also, you know, can be written in terms of Tor because we, that's also, at, you know, temperature, uh, the pressure me measurement. So um, let's say 31.8 Tor. You can also write like this. That means this is given for this particular temperature because at this particular temperature, you have sort of like, let's say maximum amount of uh, water molecules you can, you can have in air. Okay. Now, so then what you have is that there's a, a vapor pressure, which is, you know, very specific to certain temperature and then the partial pressure. Obviously right now, the partial pressure is no longer zero, right? And it increases. And then the rate at which the 
molecule, the liquid, you know, let's say the, the or water molecules are evaporating is higher than the rate at which the, you know, the gas molecules are uh, condensing. Okay. Now, one thing we can have here is as well is that, as you can think, right, at some point, the, the rate, right, is going to be basically, you know, reach some kind of equilibrium. Okay. So it's going to reach some kind of equilibrium. And that's what we have. So that means eventually we will reach equilibrium. All right, so let's say this is now represents that last state. Okay. So let's say this is gonna be then last state. There you go. So now we reach this you know, condition where um, this is, let's call this state C, where then what we have is that rate of evaporation is equals to rate of condensation. Okay, that means you have equal amount of, you know, uh, molecules evaporating and condensing, which means then, let's say for example, this vapor pressure, right? So vapor pressure. Oh, by the way, here the vapor pressure was greater than partial pressure, for the you know state B. Okay, remember vapor pressure is let's say this volume, okay, and it doesn't change. So for state one, uh, state A, when there were no gas molecules, well, vapor pressure 31.8 torr, partial pressure is zero. State B, when you have some molecules, well, you know, well, vapor pressure is 31.8 still, partial pressure, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 18, whatever it is, but it, it's less than, uh, uh, let's say, vapor pressure. Then at this point, when you get, you sort of like reach this equilibrium, right, where you have equal amount of you know, water molecule and liquid molecules going back and forth, then vapor pressure is equal to the partial pressure. Okay, so vapor pressure equals partial pressure. And then what we basically have here is this. So humidity, is basically defined as the ratio, as the ratio of partial pressure over vapor pressure. Okay. And we do like 100 times 100%. So we get percent, you know, humidity. So you can, you can see, right, for example, then for state A, when we had no air molecules um, or no, you know, let's say gas molecules, right? There, were, there was no evaporation yet. The partial pressure was zero and divide by, you know, uh, let's say 31.8, which is the, the vapor pressure so the humidity was 0%. So there was no, no humidity at all. Okay. That means for this, we can say that, you know, you get 0% humidity. Okay. For state B, when you had just, you know, some molecules evaporated already, but there were more molecules evaporating than condensing. Um, I don't know, maybe like, let's say um, it's half, right? So maybe like, let's say, uh, oh, sorry. at this point, you can say that, you know, you have a, uh, partial pressure is half of the vapor pressure. So then you can see, right, then you can do like, let's say, um, if you do, ha you know, the partial pressure divided by vapor pressure where partial pressure is half of it. Here, let's say you would get something, maybe let's say 50% for that. Okay, so 50% humidity. Maybe in that, that means the air contains half of the amount of the water, you know, the water molecules that it can have. It can have like, like twice as much, but at that instant, it has only half of it. So that's humidity is then 50%. Then right here, when we have our condition C, which is basically now it has, you know, partial pressure is equal to the vapor pressure. That means it has the maximum amount of, you know, the molecule, the water molecules can contain in the air. Then you can see, right? Humidity will be PP over VP times 100%. Then you get, well, 100% humidity. So 100% humidity when it means that partial pressure is exactly equal to the um, vapor pressure and you have the maximum amount of water molecules in the air. Okay, so that's kind of like, you know, in terms of what we have for the um, humidity. Humidity represents that. So what is the amount of the partial pressure or let, let's say how much water, you know, uh, molecules that you have or vapor, you know, how much vapor you have relative to how much you can have as a maximum amount. Okay. All right, so then also we can, use basically this um, you can see right when evaporation and condensation process are in equilibrium the vapor just above the liquid is said to be also saturated okay 
That means for state C, we can say that, you know, when this is true, that means the partial pressure and um, equals to the vapor pressure, then we can say that this is saturated. Okay. So then for the cases A and B, we can say then it's unsaturated. Okay. So A and B, A and B you can say that unsaturated because water molecules in the liquid you know, state can enter the gas state. So air has not reached the maximum amount of water it can hold. It can hold more water. So it is unsaturated. Okay. So at case A, it doesn't have anything, right? So, uh, but case B, it has some, but still it can, you know, you can still have a lot of, you know, water molecules evaporating. So we say that it's, uh, you know, unsaturated. Okay. So it, actually you can even have um, higher than 100% for humidity. Well, what does it represent? Well, it represents when um, you start then having higher Let's say if your the condensation rate increases your evaporation rate, then you have more, you know, let's say, let's say uh, gas to liquid than from liquid to gas. In that case, you can see right then partial pressure can actually be higher than the vapor pressure. And then in that, you know, you're gonna get something that is a higher than 100 percent It can happen if you suddenly, let's say, decrease the temperature. For example, think like this. So let's say right now I have. Um, temperature as 30 degrees Celsius. That means the container has a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. That means my uh, um, vapor pressure here is, as I said, right, 31.8 torr. Okay. And then I have, like, let's say my partial pressure is also 31.8 torr based on the fact that I have, you know, my maximum amount of, you know, what, you know, let's say the, the, uh, pre, uh, the vapor I can have in that in, in that air, right? That means now I have maximum amount of I can have, I can have, and then that gives me thirty one point eight torr. VP is thirty one point eight torr based on the specific temperature. But if I decrease the temperature, right? If I decrease the temperature, uh, for example, let's say if I decrease it to uh, twenty degrees, right? That means if I decrease the tw twenty degrees, then the VP is actually 17.5 torr at that temperature. So it's 17.5 torr, but I still have the same amount of, uh, let's say vapor, right? Still in the air. That means my partial pressure is still 31.8 torr, uh, like this, torr but my vapor pressure is now down to 17.5. You can do this, you can basically kind of like a quickly to remove the temperature, right? So, and have the partial pressure that is higher than uh, vapor pressure. In this case, you can see, right? If I do the ratio, I'm gonna get a number that is higher than 100%, okay? That means you can have those. So this is known as a super saturated, okay? So the super saturated, when the, the rate of your then, in this case, right? Condensation, there you go, is greater than rate of the evaporation. All right, so here's an, uh, the table of with all those, you know, values. So you can see that. So the saturated pressure, vapor pressure increases with temperature or decreases with lowering temperature in terms of, right? So you can see, right, so here's the 30 degrees. So those are the values, 31.8 torr or 4.24 times 10 to the three Pascal, okay? So since it's a ratio, probably, you know, doesn't really matter, right? So it's easier to use torr rather than, you know, uh, Pascal, because it's just, you know, easier number, right? So that means you can see, right? So here's a 30 degrees, here's uh, 20 degrees. You can see that in terms of, that's the pressure, right? That's a, that's a saturated vapor pressure. That means these are the values of the vapor pressure at those specific temperatures. Another thing we can also have here is saturated vapor density. So how many grams per cubic meter, you know, let's say you take all the, the, the vapor that you have, put it on a scale, and this gives you that basically how many, you know, grams per cubic meter you have, okay? So you can say, right, for example, at 30 degrees, it's 30.4 gram per cubic meters. At 20 degrees, it's 17.2 gram per cubic meter, right? So those are basically the values of the saturated vapor density. So that means we, we're gonna see that 
um, we can also have a <clears throat> we can have an equation, right, in terms of the the humidity that we can use this this ratio for the uh, you know let's say in terms of vapor density relative to saturated vapor density. So this is saturated vapor density, which is sort of like a constant at this particular temperature. And then vapor density depends on how much vapor you have at that instant. So similar to that ratio of the partial pressure over the vapor pressure. Okay. So here you can see, right, a liquid boils when it's saturated, vapor pressure equals the external pressure. Okay. So that means, you know, it will start, start boiling for, you know, when this condition is satisfied. All right, so let's look at then this equation. You can see, right, the partial pressure, again, it summarized, is the pressure each component of a mixture of gases would exert if it were the only gas present, okay? The partial pressure of water in the air can be as low as zero, as we saw that case A, right? And as high as the saturated vapor pressure at that temperature. That's basically case C, where, you know, you reach the equilibrium. So relative humidity is a measure of the saturation of the air. So it's a partial pressure of water divided by saturated vapor pressure of water, okay? And times 100. So that's why, you know, it was zero for case A. It, it's somewhere between zero and uh, 100 at, for case B. And, you know, let's say they are equal to one another uh, at, for case C when they're in equilibrium. Okay. That means same way we can also, as I said, right? So we can also use this, you know, in terms of another equation where you have the vapor pressure, sorry, vapor density divided by the saturated vapor density. That means what is your, you know, let's say the, 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 the percent relative humidity is also uh, in terms of vapor density that you have relative to the saturated vapor density. That means unsaturated vapor density compared to the saturated vapor density. Okay. All right, so let's look at an example here. So from the table 18.12, which is a table that we have, uh, give, given gives the, the vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius as 2.33 times 10 to the three Pascal. Okay, so use the ideal gas law to calculate the density of water vapor in grams per cubic meter that would create a partial pressure equals to this vapor pressure and compare the result with the saturated vapor density given in the table. All right, so we are given the temperature and we're given the, the vapor pressure that we have, right? So saturated vapor pressure that we have at that, uh, at that temperature. So it's asking us to basically use the ideal gas law um, to calculate the density of water, you know, vapor. That means um, the density, that means we want to find like, let's say uh, how much we have over, you know, some volume, right? So that's, you know, remember density is um, mass per volume, or in this case can be like number of moles per volume, right? So uh, we, we want to find like in sort of density of water vapor in gram per cubic meters. So we can find that by first looking at this uh, where PV equals nRT. Okay. So if I rearrange this um, so that let's say divide both sides by V and RT. So V cancels here, RT cancels over there. So I end up with N over V number of moles per unit volume, which becomes pressure over uh, R times T. Okay. So from here, then I can calculate this N over V the ratio of number of moles per unit volume as the pressure that I have, which is 2.33 times 10 to the three Pascal divided by the, the constant R, which in this case has to be in terms of joules per mole Kelvin. So it has to be the 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, then times the temperature. Remember it has to be Kelvin, not Celsius. So 273 plus 20, so 293 Kelvin. So calculating this, we're gonna get 0.957 mole per cubic meters. Okay. All right, so, well, at this point, we don't have a way of 
you know, finding this in terms of like, this doesn't give us like ground per cubic meter. So we have to do one extra step. But in this, at this point, at least we have number of, mole, number of moles per cubic meters. We need to then convert to a density in, you know, moles per cubic meters to grams per cubic meters. So then the density is equals to, so we have um, 0.957 mole per cubic meters. And then this is basically in terms of what is, how, many, how much is one mole of this, uh, let's say substance, right? In this case, water. And that's, you know, 18 gram per mole. Okay, so 18 gram, that means one mole of, you know, uh, water, right, is uh, 18 grams. So then here we can see the moles cancel out and then we have then gram per cubic meter. So this becomes 17.2 gram per cubic meters. That means we got that, right? So for a vapor pressure of water, okay? So we got 17.2 gram per cubic meter, okay? So then if you go to the table, remember we were at 20 degrees, right? If we go to the table, we can see that um, at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, the saturated vapor pressure is indeed 17.2 gram per cubic meter. That's basically, we just derived that, right? We derived that quantity from the, the temperature that we were given and the pressure that we were given, right? So we could see that saturated vapor density indeed is 17.2 gram per cubic meter. All right, so that's kind of what we have. Next, next let's talk about <clears throat> in terms of uh, what is a dew point, okay. So what we have here is then the dew point basically represents in terms of uh, at that specific temperature, right? Uh, it's a measurement of sort of like actual moisture that air, you know, air contains. So in terms of then this dew point, so if, if you go back and, you know, let's say recall that case C, so we can say that when the partial pressure equals the vapor pressure, right? And that's basically the dew point. Uh, you can say that there's a dew point of the temperature. So the dew point is the temperature at which the air would be saturated with water, okay? So if the temperature goes below the dew point, then dew fog or even rain may occur. And remember, when we say that saturated, that means it has uh, the maximum amount of uh, water vapor it can contain, okay? So one thing we can do here is then when we, you know, if we cool down, then the condensation will exceed evaporation, right? So as I mentioned already, and so the liquid will become, will start beginning to condense and then we can have a fog and cloud, right? And precipitation, all that can happen because let's say when you, lower the temperature, then you basically, let's say below the dew point, right? Then you can have those, you know, uh, let's say dew fog and the rain and things like that. All right, so here's one more example in this. So calculate the percent relative humidity on a day when the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and air contains 9.40 gram of water vapor per cubic meters. Okay, so let's do that first, you know, that part. So the calculating the percent relative humidity. All right, so in, in order for us to calculate the percent relative humidity, um, we just need to use this equation, right? Where let's say percent relative humidity is equals to. So you can either look at it as a, the, the ratio of partial pressure uh, divided by the saturated va uh, vapor pressure, or you can look at it in terms of the, because we're given how much uh, wa uh, water vapor we have, we can do it in terms of vapor pressure, sorry, vapor density uh, relative to the saturated vapor density. Okay. So, for this one, then we are given that we have 9.4 gram per cubic meters. Then what is the saturated vapor pressure density? Okay. Now, if you go back to the table, you will see that at this 
specific temperature, the amount of water that we can have cannot exceed 23 gram per cubic meters. So we still have, you know, quite a lot way to go. So that means the relative humidity, we just have, you know, not even half of how much we can have maximum amount. So re relative humidity will be 40.9%. Okay, so, well, remember, so technically if I multiply this by 100%, then I will get that because it says relative, percent relative. So you have to multiply that by 100%. So you get 40.9%. Okay, that means we have a 40.9% humidity, percent relative humidity. Part B it says, at what temperature will this air reach 100% relative humidity? Basically the saturation density. Okay. This temperature is the dew point. Remember, that means, you know, the, the saturation, you know, the temperature where the, you get 100% relative humidity, where then the partial pressure equals to the vapor pressure or vapor density is equal to the saturated vapor density. That means you have, you know, maximum amount of uh, vapor, you know, let's say molecules in the air, then that's what we call a dew point. All right, so we can, we can calculate that, um, which is basically going uh, and looking at the, at the table, because one thing we have is that, let's say we do have 9.4 gram of uh, vapor pressure. It says at what temperature will this air reach 100% humidity? We can see that at 25 degrees Celsius, well, it, it will not reach 100% humidity. At 25 degrees Celsius, it only reaches 40.9%, you know, 40.9% humidity. So if you go back to the table, we can try to see that, you know, what is the, let's say, temperature that can reach 100% humidity with given amount of uh, water vapor. So obviously you can see, right, for the 25 degrees Celsius that, that we have in this example, right, um, we need 23 gram per cubic meter in order to reach uh, dew point. But we only have 9.4. That means with 9.4, in order for us at that instant to have, you know, let's say dew point or 100% uh, percent relative humidity, we need to decrease the temperature to 10, 10 degrees Celsius. That means if we decrease the temperature to 10 degrees Celsius, that means at that instant, the maximum amount of uh, water vapor we can have is 9.4 gram per cubic meters. And we do have that much, right? We just happen to have that much already. That means we can say that we have reached then uh, dew point of that particular, uh, let's say amount of water, okay? That means this is the 10, 10 degree Celsius is the dew point for 9.4 gram per cubic meter, you know, uh, water vapor. Okay, so let's go back then the other part. So that means, you know, let's say that this was part A, part B is then the temperature is equal to 10 degrees Celsius, okay? Because of that temperature, right? So saturated vapor pressure uh, density, and put it like this, is then is equals to 9.4 gram per cubic meters. So then this ratio will be, so percent relative humidity will be equals to then uh, vapor density over saturated vapor density, just easy to write it like this, times 100%. So then I'm gonna get 9.4 over 9.4 times 100. That will give me then 100%. Because 9.4 over 9.4 is one times 100, I get 100%. All right, so part C is asking then, what is the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius. All right, so let's see what we have. That means we are given that the humidity, um, what is the humidity when the air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius? Okay, but the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius. Well, we need to go back and see, let's say how much, in a way you can think like this information is given so that we can figure out how much of that vapor density we can use, okay? And since we already know 
that at the for the humidity uh, or the temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, um, we need uh, from the table, right, 23 gram per cubic meters. So if you go back again to look at the table, uh, we can see that, all right, so this was at 25 degrees Celsius. And then at negative 10, we can see it's 2.36. That means, you know, let's say if the dew point is here, that means we can have, you know, 2.36. That means, let's say, assuming that uh, for the amount of, let's say, vapor that we have, the dew point is negative 10 degrees Celsius, which in a way tells you how much you have, because if the dew point for this amount of water, you know, water, uh, water vapor that you have is negative 10, that means this many, you have this much, you know, let's say uh, water vapor. Then we go back. And we say, all right, so for part C, that means we are given that there's only 2.36 gram per cubic meters because, you know, dew point of this, let's say, uh, particular amount of, you know, vapor pressure that we have is this much. And then this is then divided by uh, how much it can contain at 25 degrees Celsius, which is again, 23 point gram per cubic meters. Okay. Then we can see that if we have this much, you know, uh, vapor pressure, or the, the sorry, the water, water vapor, uh, but maximum of we can have is that. That means, um, well, percent relative humidity is then going to be equals to 22.36 divided by 23 is around, you know, let's say times 100 percent, so roughly 10.3 percent. That means 10.3%. That means our humidity will be 10.3 because we are given only 2.36 gram per cubic meter, you know, in a region where it can contain, you know, about 10 times more uh, water molecules. All right, so that was this, you know, the last part of this. Next, we're gonna talk about, um, again, remember, so we are kind of discussing in terms of how the real gas is different from the ideal gases. I mean, this is, you know, another example where in the ideal gas, let's say model, we don't take the size of those molecules into account. We say that the, the sizes are too small so we can treat them more or less like a particle. But obviously, you know, they are not, you know, completely particle, right? They do have a size. And we can think of like, let's say the closest they can get to one another is from a center to center is this to our distance. Right? That's kind of like a closest they can get to one another. And as they get that close, that means before, if, if I, when I treat them like a particle like that, but now I'm treating like a spheres, that means this two hour distance is no longer available in a container where these particles are. That means imagine, right, this much space now, or, or like, let's say that much space is no longer available. So the volume that I used before will be should be less than the volume I actually have now because you know some of the volume is occupied by those particles and that's kind of what we have right this wonder wall equation of state takes into account that so it says we assume that some fraction b of the volume is unavailable due to the finite size of the molecules we also expect that the pressure will be reduced by a factor proportional to the square of the density due to the in interactions near the walls, okay? So this gives the van der Waals equation of state, which, you know, contains this constant A and B, those factors, and which are basically experimentally determined, like everything, most of the things in physics, right? So then this equation, right? PV equals NRT kind of becomes modified, where this is sort of like a P term, right? Including the, let's say, the you know proportion of the square of the densities right, um, and then you have the volume, which takes into into account how many molecules we or how much what's the number of moles? Remember, it's just number of moles is just information about how many how many particles you have, right? How many particles you have? So the volume minus how many particles you have and how much space they occupy. So that means you know this equation kind of gives you much more accurate, much more realistic 
you know, overall volume uh, in, your, in your system. All right, so that's why, you know, if you look at then the diagram, diagram for the, you know, uh, that we looked at earlier, uh, remember, so uh, we can see that more or less those diagrams can just slightly shift, right? So you can, you can see, right, you're given it, you know, four different temperatures. You have T A, B, um, C, and D. And from what we looked at before, A, B, C is pretty much identical to, to what we had and where the, this was, remember, that the, the critical point, right? Bef you know, beyond which it goes from, uh, let's say, a gas to a, to a liquid. So most of those, you know, the curves basically fit really nice with the experimental data. Uh, the one that, you know, a little bit different is the D, right? So the curve D, uh, you can see right, is below the, the critical, you know, critical point and passes through this, you know, this liquid vapor region. So as, as, as it goes through that, instead of in the previous graph that we looked at, it goes in like, like straight without, you know, changing its pressure. Here we can see that the pressure actually varies. So you go from, you know, increased pressure, decreased pressure, then increased pressure again, a little bit back and forth, right? So that kind of, you know, like you have a little more, you know, variation in that for the, uh, for that. So you have, you have a maximum point, which is point B, and then you have a minimum point, which is, you know, point D over there, right? So you have those two points. Um, and, you know, uh, in terms of, let's say, this kind of like, let's compare to that more, more theoretical, remember the theoretical, um, still, you know, in, in a way, when we look at the previous diagram of the real gases, that was still like sort of like a theoretical one, right? So this is a more realistic, experimental, let's say, look at the real gases, where the Van der Waal, you know, equation of state takes into account all those, you know, uh, extra space and the densities, thing like that, they come into play. Okay, so that's kind of like, you know, the differences of those two graphs. All right. So another thing we have here is what we call mean free path. So this is um, takes into account the, the you know the, the the motion of the particles. So you can see right uh, because now they're not point particles but they have a finite size. The the molecules in um, in a gas undergo frequent collisions. And you know we've also mentioned that before, right? So even if it's a ideal gas, so the molecules collide with one another, collide with the you know the wall of the container, and what we have here is now that sort of like let's say they collide with one particle and then what is the sort of like a distance they have to travel until they collide again and you know collide again that means you know like let's say how far they have to go in order to collide maybe another particle or another wall that means you know this is what we call mean free path that means the average distance a molecule travels between collisions mean free path um, generally given with uh, here, like let's say L M. Sometimes you know some books use lambda M for that, uh, but it is in terms of you can see right. Can we can calculate from the average speed, the density of the gas, uh, the size of the molecules, and the relative speed of colliding molecules. So an equation then becomes one over four pi square root of two r square and n over v. So in this case, what we have here is the V is the velocity, R is the radius. This, this, this R is the radius of those particles. So V dt is the distance that they actually travel, um, let's say. And um, then, let, you know, in terms of what we can talk about here is N over V here is number of particles per unit volume. So you pretty much end up with this equation that can allow you to calculate that average, you know, um, average, like, let's say, mean free path. Okay. So here's one equation where this sort of like, it, 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 this is lambda over here is basically same as LM, as I said, right? Some, in some books, you know, that mean free path is pretty much given it in terms of that, you know, quantity lambda, which is, which is not the wavelength, but, you know, just known as a mean free path. All right, so in terms of then, um, show that mean free path for molecule in an ideal gas at temperature T and pressure P is given as lambda or the mean free path equals KT over two pi D square and square root of two. Okay. 
So, you know, pretty much uh, in terms of like, let's say, looking at deriving that equation for the mean free path. Now, in terms of then what we have, we kind of given a hint over there, right? Um, ideal gas at the temperature T and the pressure P. Uh, that means you can think of like, let's say, you know, we start with the ideal gas equation, right? So we have a PV equals NRT. We start with that. So then in terms of, let's say this equation, right? PV equals NRT. Um, so we can look at it in, like, let's say, if you come back over here, remember, so here we're using number of molecules. So in this equation, there is number of moles. So, and we can look at it in terms of this number of moles, if you remember, right? It was number of molecules per Avogadro number. That means it's how much you have uh, total number of molecules over Avogadro number. That is, you know, what we use for the uh, number of moles, okay? That means one of the things I can do here is in my ideal gas law equation, uh, I can replace that number of, you know, number of moles with that. So let's say if I have a volume here and I can say that this is number of moles, sorry, number of moles replaced with number of molecules times RT divided by Avogadro number like this. And then what I have here is if I rearrange this, so write it in terms of, let's say, the equation that we have right here, where, um, let me rewrite that equation over there. So I have, uh, I just call this lambda, right? So LM, which is same as lambda. So, um, so this is basically given as one over four pi, square root of two, or square, then N over V. Remember, so this is N over V is number of molecules per unit volume. Okay. And in this equation here, we want to say that lambda is equals to kt over 2 pi then times pressure times d square then square root of 2. Okay. That means, you know, like let's say to show that this is basically equation that we can derive where d square is, you know, pretty much same as r square. Okay, so they're pretty much the same thing. All right, so now one, one thing we can see from here is, um, let's say we, we got this equation over here where I also have a, you know, let's say pressure over there. So PV equals now replacing number of molecules with the uh, number of moles with the number of molecules per Avogadro number. So then if I continue with this, I can say that, okay, then pressure is equals to NRT over V. And then I move the, the, the volume here, right? And then I have Avogadro number over here. So from here, then I can take this N over V which is number of molecules per unit volume. Then I have R over Avogadro number, then times temperature. Okay. Now, one of the things we talked about earlier is that the, the R, which is the, the gas constant, it is the, you know, it is equals to Avogadro number of molecules times the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And that's the Stefan Boltzmann constant right there. That means if I divide both sides by NA, it means that the ratio of R over NA is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It means I can replace this with the Stefan Boltzmann constant, KD. Okay. All right, so that means we are getting kind of closer so now I have this equation where P 
um, equals n over v kb times t. So now I think about this, if I divide both sides kbt, that means that's what my n over v ratio is equals to. n over v ratio equals p over kb times t. Okay. That means what I can do here is, now sort of like a final step, take that general equation, okay, and replace this ratio of n over v with p over kbt, okay. That means lambda is equals to one over four pi square root of two r square, and then n over v becomes then p over kbt, and then kbt goes upward, right? Goes up, so it becomes kbt, then four pi times pressure times r square times square root of two. And that's basically our final answer for that. We can show that I can go from here, the general equation, right? From this general equation to this equation by replacing that, you know, N over V in terms of the pressure and the temperature. That means replacing two of those state variables with, uh, with another two. All right, so here, one more example. Calculate the mean free path of air molecules at the pressure of 3.5 times 10 to the negative 13 ATM and the temperature of 300 Kelvin. Model the air molecules as spheres of radius of two times 10 to the negative 10 meters. All right. So that means for this, we are given pressure. Let me use a different color here. So we're given the pressure, 3.5 times 10 to the negative 13 atm. We're given the temperature, 300 Kelvin. And we're given the radius, right? Two times 10 to the negative 10 meters. And now, one of the reasons that I derived that equation for you in the previous example is that we can now use that equation to calculate the, the mean free path, right? Uh, from that equation, because this equ equals to kt, then four pi square root of two r squared times pressure, okay? That means what I can have here is, you know, I don't need to like calculate then N, then V and things like that, because let's say we can see, right? We're not given that from here, but you know, this equation shows that we don't really need that. So from here, I can calculate the, you know, the Boltzmann constant is equals to 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin, then 300 Kelvin, then divided by four pi square root of two, then the radius, which is two times 10 to the negative 10 meters squared, then the pressure. Okay, so, which is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 13 ATM. I cannot keep this in ATM because there is a joules over there, which assumes that pressure should be in Pascal. So we need to make that conversion. So we have to convert or one ATM is 1.013 times 10 to the five Pascal. Okay, so then we can cancel that. All right, so calculating everything should give us 1.6 times 10 to the five meters. All right, so that's basically, um, you can see, right? It, it, you know, it's a very low pressure, right? It's a very low pressure. So the distance here is insanely high, right? 1.6 times 10 to the five meters, which is 160 thousand meters right but it's a it's a you know low pressure means that very few molecules or they're moving very slow okay so this is this is indeed a very low pressure um remember at the room temperature right so we have like one atm at you know at the, so like a sea level all right so the last thing we have in this chapter is um, diffusion so here you know so that we can see an example right so you have a few drops of food coloring uh, let's say you drop it in the water and eventually you can see it starts spraying out, you know, initially maybe like slowly, but eventually becomes, you know, let's say um, you can see right initially, you can see a little bit of, you know, separation between them. But then after, after some, some time, it becomes pretty much uniform. So that's kind of what we have for the diffusion. So you can see, right, even without steering, a few drops of dye in water will gradually spread throughout. This process is called diffusion. Okay. 
And there's actually, you know, a model for that. So that means with, what you can see here is that it goes always, you know, from one region to another, there's like a direction and that direction is always goes from region where there's a high concentration to region where there's a low concentration. And diffusion occurs, you know, always in that direction, always goes from high concentration to low concentration until eventually, you know, you get so, so like a uniform, you know, system, okay. But you can see that, you, you know, because there, there's a sort of like a motion of those, you know, particles, right? Let's say mixture, you can then have some kind of the rate at which that diffusion occurs. So this is that equation, you know, this quantity that we call rate of diffusion. And this is equals to D, which is the diffusion constant. And here's a table where we can see those constants times A is that, which is the, you know, from here you can see, right? It's cross-sectional area, you know, through which this, you know, mixture is moving and times that um, DCDX, okay? So here, uh, you know, in terms of like, let's say you can see, right? How the concentration is moving from one region to another region as a function of position. So that's pretty much, you know, what we have in this, you know, in this equation. So that you can see that in terms of the diffusion constant, right? It's different for, you know, different type of, you know, uh, molecules and um, this you know c minus c2 minus c1 here is that's basically in terms of that that's a different than concentration per unit per unit distance all right so here's then an, an example for that so you have oxygen diffuses from the surface of inse insects to um, to the interior through tiny tubes called trachea. An average trachea is about two millimeter long and has a cross section area of two times 10 to the negative nine square meters. Assuming the concentration of oxygen inside is half what it is outside in the atmosphere, show that the concentration of oxygen in the air, assuming 21% of oxygen at 20 degrees Celsius is about 8.7 moles per cubic meters. Then calculate the diffusion rate J and estimate the average time for molecule to diffuse. Um, and assume the diffusion constant is one time 10 to the negative five meters square per second. Okay, so, so we can think of it like this. So let's say if you're considering um, rate of diffusion, so you can think of it like, let's say to be to the number of molecules, which is you can, use, you know, capital N, right? So the number of molecules moving through some cross-sectional area A is a function of time. So J can also be written like that. So number of molecules per, per unit time, okay? That means using this equation and using that, you know, equation where J is equals to dA then dc dx and then you know ideal gas like equation p equals pv equals nrt so then you know we can then solve for the you know part a which says that show that the you can see right show that the concentration of oxygen in air at 20 degrees celsius is about 8.7 mole per cubic meters so we have like 21 percent of 21 percent of air is is oxygen so we want to show that um, also, you know, we were given in terms of the, the you know, the, the cross-sectional area. All right, so we start with part A showing that, um, let's say, um, the concentration, right? So the concentration of oxygen in air is 8.7 moles per cubic meter. Okay. So moles per cubic meters is, in a way, means that if I take this equation, and divide both sides by N and then by P, both sides. Then here I get, you know, cancel the pressure. So then what I end up with, uh, sorry, actually, I'm gonna to need to do other way around because I need number of molecule, number of moles per unit volume, right? So PV equals NRT. So I divide by uh, volume R and T, both sides. 
So the volume goes away, RT goes away. So then I have this number of molecules, number of moles per unit volume, and equals P over RT. So uh, when we talk about then um, pressure, the air pressure, right? So we assume that air pressure is one ATM. Remember, so at the, at the standard, you know, let's say at the sea level, it's one ATM. And then we're told that oxygen is 21% of those. That means the pressure that oxygen molecules exert is just basically, you know, 21% of that one ATM. That means pressure will be 0.21 times uh, atmospheric pressure of one ATM, which is 1.13 1, 1 times 10 to the five Pascal, then divided by 8.31 four joules per mole Kelvin, then the temperature, which was um, 20 degrees Celsius, right, ends up being 293 Kelvin. Always must use Kelvin for this calculations. All right, so now because of now, I have only, you know, 21% contribution from oxygen to the uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, we can then at this specific temperature, we can calculate then N over V to be 8.7, sorry, just 8.7 mole per cubic meters. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, all right, so that's that's part A, right? So that's basically for uh, for us in terms of the, uh, let's say the, the concentration, right? At, at that you know at the temperature. So part B then is asking, calculate the diffusion rate J. Means we can calculate in terms of the uh, what we have is that the concentration is at 20 degrees Celsius, and it says, remember that says, assuming the concentration of oxygen inside is half, it is uh, what it is outside, and we calculate what it is outside, 8.7 mole per you know cubic meters. That means inside is exactly half of that. That means you know half of 8.73. So that means when we go and for part B, calculate then J, you know, since we're talking about in terms of, let's say, um, oxygen going through, you know, let's say uh, some region and there's outside and inside, right? So the two different concentration. So then we use this, you know, this equation over here, D times A, then DC DX, uh, which basically becomes just sort of like, let's say, approximately DA and delta C delta X. Okay, delta C, delta X. All right, so we we can take then uh, this diffusion constant for air um, and for, for, you know, in terms of like, let's say the, the oxygen, right? So we can take that to be uh, two times 10 to the, sorry, one times 10 to the negative five. Which is meter square over second. Um, and then we were given that the cross sectional area A, two times 10 to the negative nine square meters. And then from here, we can look at it in terms of the, the difference between concentration, you know, one and concentration two. So basically, this is, you know, uh, let's say C2 minus C1, right? C2 minus C1, where we can think of like, let's say the C2 here is the concentration uh, inside and minus the concentration outside, but this is the, pretty much the difference. So we can, you know, like, let's say even look at it in terms of sort of like absolute value. But the idea here is uh, we have, this is, you know, outside and inside is exactly half of it. So if I take an 8.7 uh, mole per cubic meters minus half of it, which is like roughly 8.35 mole per cubic meters. So then that's basically, that's what goes here, right? So 8.7 minus 4.35, then divided by the dx, which is the length, and we were given that to be two times 10 to the negative three meters. So using that, we can say that 
j here is equals to uh, roughly four times 10 to the negative 11 mole per second, which is the you know equation for the, the diffusion rate, j for diffusion rate. That means four times 10 to the negative 11 mole each second, you know, going from uh, let's say region one to region two, you know, basically between those regions. The last one was asking us um, estimate the average time for the molecules to diffuse. That means what will be the, uh, you know, so this part, remember, so we were also given the diffusion rate here. So estimate the average time for this. As I, as I mentioned, right, there's another equation for the uh, diffusion rate in terms of number of molecules divided by, let's say, uh, by time. So from here then, what we can do here is that if I take then that equation, then rearrange then becomes T is equals to N over N over J. Okay. So then, then this becomes N over, so then J is basically D A then Delta X over Delta C, right? So Delta C over Delta X. which then can kind of, you know, be rearranged where I have um, C here is, which is the, you know, average concentration. So the average concentration, let's take to be roughly number of molecules per unit volume. That's a, the sort of like an average concentration where volume is, nothing but A times Delta X. Okay, A times Delta X. And what we can do from here is, I can see right, if I rearrange, then N is equals to average concentration times, you know, A times Delta X, something like this. All right, so the reason we do that because then we can re you know, rearrange this equation where it's the number of molecules over the uh, concentration rate where we can replace something like this. If I now use this one over here, if I continue like that, that becomes N times this DX goes up, becomes DX over the constant times area, then times delta C. So then what I can do from here, now replace N with that. Let's use this. So it becomes C average A delta X times another delta X, which is this delta X that was there, then divided by D A delta C. And from here, you can see, right, the A cancels out. And then we have C average, delta X square, divided by delta C times D. Okay. That means we pretty much, you know, end up with this equation. Okay. And then we can then use this to calculate for the, for the average time. So that means this is this is basically roughly what the average time it equals to. All right, so let me kind of let me clean it up over here so then we can write it over there. Run out of room. All right. Then the time is equals to again. So average concentration times delta x squared divided by delta c times d. Okay. Now in terms of then, what is average concentration? Well, remember the concentration that we got is for the inside and outside. So we have two numbers. So this Delta C is the difference between them. Average is just then the sum of them divided by two, right? That means if you have two things, their average is adding them together divided by two. That means this average is C1 plus C2 divided by two. That's what it is. Then times delta X square, then delta C times D. And that's pretty much what we end up with. So this is uh, 
8.7 plus 4.35 divided by two, then times two times 10, 10 to the negative three meters square, divided then the difference between 8.7 minus 4.35, just not enough room, so I'm, I'm just gonna skip the units for now. But then the, the constant, right? One times 10 to the negative five diffusion constant, um, meter square over second. Now putting everything together, then we can calculate this to be 0.6 seconds. Okay, and that's basically the, the average time. All right, so this concludes this chapter.